Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Welcome to today's presentation on closing the naloxone gap, how pharmacists can help reduce overdose deaths. The goal of today's presentation is to provide you with the knowledge and resources that you need to increase access to naloxone in your communities and ultimately to help reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths. My name is William Eggleston. I'm a pharmacist, a clinical toxicologist, and an assistant professor at the Binghamton University School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. My expertise and research focuses on harm reduction or strategies that we can use to help reduce the potential harms associated with opioid use. This activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support, and I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose. By the end of today's presentation, you'll have a better understanding of the barriers that people face in the United States when trying to access naloxone and how alternative distribution models can help us to overcome some of these barriers. We'll take a closer look at these different models to better understand uh, the different components of them, understand the devices involved, uh, and how each of these can impact the efficacy of the program. And lastly, uh, we'll describe some patient care strategies that can help you to increase access to naloxone and other harm reduction resources for patients in your community. So why do we need to talk about naloxone today? And to understand that, there's really two important concepts you need to be aware of. The first is that the number of people dying from opioid overdoses in the United States is on the rise and has been increasing precipitously over the last decade. So we have a lot of people who are dying as a result of toxicity from opioids. The second thing you need to understand is that we have an antidote, naloxone or Narcan, that can reverse the effects of opioids in the overdose setting, meaning that we already have at least one solution to the problem. We have a medication that can prevent a death if administered within a timely manner after an opioid overdose. So why, if we have this antidote, are people continuing to die? The answer to this is complicated, nuanced, but one of the reasons that we know for sure that people are continuing to die from opioid overdose is that when an overdose happens, those people who are around in that moment either don't have the tools that they need, the naloxone that can reverse the overdose, or they don't have the knowledge or confidence that they need to use those tools. These individuals are suffering from what we call the bystander effect. They're in this situation, they can see something bad is happening, they want to help, but they don't have the tools or knowledge they need to help in that moment. One of the easiest ways we can fix this is by doing a better job of getting people at least the tools that they need, the naloxone that can reverse the overdose. 
both the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Surgeon General have said that one of the primary ways that we can start to reduce overdose deaths in the United States is by increasing access to naloxone. Now, there's lots of ways we can do this, but in order to do it most effectively, we need to have an understanding of what the overdose crisis looks like today in the United States and how these different strategies can be useful in different situations. So most opioid overdose deaths in the United States are caused by blank. Is it heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, or morphine? The correct answer is fentanyl. We can see here, looking at overdose deaths from 1999 through 2019, that synthetic opioids, primarily fentanyl, are the primary reason we're seeing an increase in overdose deaths from opioids in the United States. Now, that's not to minimize the deaths from these other agents as well. We've seen a huge number of deaths from prescription opioids, including medications like oxycodone and hydrocodone. We've seen a huge number of deaths from heroin. So, although fentanyl is the primary cause of most overdose deaths in the United States, all opioids contribute in a large manner to the total number of overdose deaths that we see. And we need to be cognizant of this when designing naloxone distribution programs. The way we try to reduce deaths from illicitly manufactured fentanyl might be different than the way we try to reduce deaths from prescription oxycodone. It's also important to realize that these deaths don't tell the whole story. Not everyone who overdoses necessarily dies from that overdose. There's a large pool of individuals who have had what we call a non-fatal overdose, meaning they overdose on an opioid, they experience the toxicity of an overdose, but ultimately they do not die from that overdose. And so when we look at these numbers, we realize that there's an even broader number of individuals who could potentially benefit from increased access to naloxone. In fact, about 40% of individuals who are using opioids, either prescription or non-prescription, uh, have had a non-fatal overdose as a result of their opioid use. So how do we do a better job of getting these patients access to the naloxone that they need? Well, the first step that we need to take in order to bridge this access gap towards increasing naloxone availability is to realize that we need to look at our two separate patient populations in two different ways. And that's because the strategies that we use for one patient might be very different than the strategies we use for another. So we're going to break our patient population into two groups today. We're going to have our patients with chronic pain who are taking prescription opioids and discuss strategies to increase access to naloxone among that group. And then we'll talk about our patients who have opioid use disorder and look at ways we can expand access to naloxone for those patients. So when looking at patients with chronic pain, one marker that we can use to see if those individuals are getting access to the naloxone that they need is by looking at naloxone prescription rates in the United States. And if you just look at the raw numbers and you look from 2012 through 2018, you might get the sense that we're doing a good job. We increased the number of naloxone prescriptions from just about 1,200 back in 2012 to about half a million uh, by 2018. So just this data is, is promising. It suggests we're moving in the right direction. The trend is a good one. However, when you compare the total number of naloxone prescriptions to the total number of individuals receiving high-dose opioid prescriptions, you realize the gap is still quite wide. You might have to squint a little, but the blue box at the bottom of this bar graph represents the number of naloxone descriptions dispensed in the same time period. And what you realize fairly quickly is that we are only providing naloxone to a fraction of patients who are receiving high-dose opioids. In total, for every 20 patients who receive a prescription for a high-dose opioid, only one of those 20 patients also receives a prescription for naloxone. So let's take a closer look at our chronic pain population so we can get a better understanding of what's going wrong and how we might be able to fix that. Naloxone prescribing rates are blank in urban areas compared to rural areas. 
higher, lower, the same. Naloxone prescribing rates are in fact higher in urban areas than they are in rural areas. More specifically, you can see that prescribing rates in both metropolitan and micropolitan communities have outpaced those in rural communities, although all three uh, communities have seen an increase in prescription rates. So overall, this is a positive, but it does let us know that we should probably be targeting strategies that could potentially be more effective within rural communities. We can use this same data to look at prescription rates on a county by county basis and target those counties or regions where naloxone prescribing rates are the lowest in order to improve access for this potentially high risk group. So who should we be co-prescribing naloxone to? And what co-prescribing means is that when a patient goes to the pharmacy, or wherever they access their medication and they are prescribed an opioid, they are also prescribed naloxone at the same time as that opioid. The goal of co-prescribing programs is to ensure that a patient who has access to an opioid who is at risk for an unintentional overdose will have naloxone available should they ever need it to reverse the effects of an unintentional overdose. So which patients should be leaving the pharmacy with naloxone when they leave with their opioid. The Department of Health and Human Services has identified four high-risk groups, and these groups are individuals who are most at risk for suffering from the effects of an unintentional opioid overdose and who should be co-prescribed naloxone along with their opioid. They include patients who are on high-dose opioids, which is defined as more than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day. As we saw from our data a little bit earlier, this is a group where we're not doing a very good job. Only about 1 in 20 patients receiving more than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day receive a co-prescription for naloxone. So this is one area where we can specifically target uh, to very easily increase co-prescribing rates among those individuals on high-dose opioids. The next population is patients with respiratory disease. So those patients who have COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, they are at higher risk for the effects of an unintentional overdose and should have access to naloxone in their home. The third group is those who are concomitantly prescribed a CNS or a respiratory depressant. So think medications like benzodiazepines. These patients are at higher risk for unintentional overdose and therefore should have access to naloxone. And the last is our patients who have substance use disorder or opioid use disorder, especially those who have used illicit opioids or who have a history of a recent incarceration. So for any patient in one of these four populations who is receiving prescription opioids, they should also receive prescription naloxone. Blank is R the most effective way to increase naloxone co-prescribing. Academic detailing, standing orders, mandatory co-prescribing. correct answer is mandatory co-prescribing. What we know is that although all three of these strategies do help to increase naloxone co-prescribing rates, only mandatory co-prescribing has been shown to both increase rates of prescription as well as to increase uh, patient acceptance of prescription and to actually have that person bring naloxone home with them as a result of that co-prescription. Let's take a closer look at this. So, the research supports that academic detailing works. What academic detailing means is we have someone who is a part of the healthcare team who speaks with their colleagues, provides them with information, education, helps them to understand why increasing access to naloxone for patients with these risk factors is important. Uh, so this is data uh, looking at academic detailing with a pharmacist as a member of the healthcare team. 
and the role of the pharmacist was to identify high-risk patients and help the team understand why those high-risk patients should be co-prescribed naloxone. As you can see, when a pharmacist is actively providing academic detailing to the team, the number of naloxone prescriptions go up. Academic detailing can also have a broader indirect effect on healthcare culture overall. Looking here at data from the VA, what you can see with the blue line is that, again, when you provide a pharmacist on the team who is identifying high-risk patients and providing academic detailing as to why these individuals should be receiving co-prescriptions for naloxone, the number of naloxone prescription goes up. But more interestingly, in the red line, you see the number of naloxone prescriptions provided by individuals who are not receiving academic detailing. So these were teams or providers who were seeing patients who were high risk, who were not directly uh, receiving academic detailing, but these individuals also increased the number of naloxone prescriptions that they were providing, suggesting that academic detailing can have a broader effect on individuals working within a healthcare community, even if those individuals are not directly receiving that academic detailing. So what are the best ways for us to implement academic detailing at our healthcare institutions? One strategy that we can use is to identify those subspecialties who provide opioid prescriptions at high rates who are not also co-prescribing naloxone. Looking at this data set specifically, it would make most sense to have a pharmacist provide academic detailing for a surgeon or a primary care physician than it would for a psychiatrist. However, there are regional differences with regard to naloxone prescribing rates, so it would make more sense for you to work with your healthcare team to identify where a pharmacist would be most effective for increasing rates of naloxone prescriptions. Unfortunately, solving this problem is not as easy as just providing academic detailing. If we take a closer look at the data, we can see that although it does increase prescribing rates, this may not necessarily be the rate limiting step. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at one of these programs. So this is another example of an academic detailing program in which a pharmacist worked with a primary care team to identify high risk patients so that that primary care team could provide naloxone co-prescriptions when providing opioid prescriptions for those individual patients identified. So we can see here that pre and post intervention, there was certainly an increase in the number of eligible patients receiving naloxone prescriptions. It didn't fix the entire problem. There was still a fairly large chunk of patients who weren't receiving naloxone prescriptions. And the hope is that that number would continue to increase over time. The problem with this data set is that it doesn't tell the entire story. When you look at those patients who actually went on to receive the naloxone co-prescription, the vast majority of them didn't ever pick it up. So about two-thirds of patients who received a prescription for naloxone never actually walked out of a pharmacy with naloxone. And so we need to understand why that is. If we're co-prescribing this antidote, but people aren't taking it, then it doesn't fix the issue. If there's an unintentional overdose and they never picked up their naloxone, well, it's not gonna be very helpful in that moment. So when you ask these patients, why didn't you pick up the naloxone? A few of them provided cost as a reason, a few of them had an issue with their pharmacy, but the vast majority of them just simply were not able to provide a reason for why they didn't pick up their naloxone. Now, one potential reason why people may have not picked up the naloxone is that there is stigma associated with picking up naloxone. People have perceptions of what naloxone is and why people need to have it in their homes. And this stigma can create an environment in which someone who would potentially benefit from having access to naloxone and who really should have naloxone in their home doesn't feel comfortable walking out of a pharmacy with naloxone, keeping it in their home, and having it available in case there's ever an emergency. And a big part of this is because there's this idea of naloxone is not something that's for me. Naloxone is for someone with substance use disorder. When you ask patients their perceptions of naloxone, it's pretty clear that most individuals don't believe that Naloxone is something that someone taking prescription opioids needs access to. 
So when you ask patients if naloxone is only necessary for people who abuse opioids, about 42% say that yes, that is true. About 37% say that only people who abuse opioids are at risk of opioid overdose. And over half say that having naloxone available enables people who abuse opioids. So a big chunk of our patients who are taking prescription opioids, they have the impression that naloxone is an antidote only once you've developed a substance use disorder. And if you're taking prescription opioids as prescribed, you're not at risk for overdose. You're only at risk for overdose if you're abusing opioids. And so if we're going to increase access to naloxone through co-prescribing, we need to find ways to change these perceptions because we can co-prescribe as much naloxone as we want. But if the patient at the end of the day doesn't take that naloxone home, naloxone home with them, then that program is not having any real benefit for these patients. The only real strategy that we've seen up until today that's demonstrated clearly an increase not only in co-prescribing rates, but also patients actually physically taking that naloxone and going home with it, or maybe even changing their perceptions of the naloxone, is by providing regulations that require mandatory co-prescribing. So these are regulations that say if you meet one of these Department of Health and Human Services risk factors, you need to walk home and have naloxone with you along with your opioid prescription. And that's because that's the law. And this really does seem to have an impact because it creates an opportunity for the healthcare team to have that conversation with the patient and say, look, you know, you're at risk, but this is also mandatory. So it's not something that you're specifically being targeted for. Everyone who meets one of these populations goes home with naloxone. It makes the patient feel differently about it to say, okay, well, this is not me being targeted specifically for any reason. It's just the rules. And so I'm more comfortable going home with that naloxone when it's the rules and not because it's something specific about me as a patient. There is certainly still a lot of work and research to be done in this space, but the things that we do know today are that we are not prescribing enough naloxone for patients in these high-risk groups, and even when we are prescribing naloxone, they aren't necessarily comfortable enough to go and pick that prescription up and bring it home with them. Mandatory co-prescribing is one potential solution that can help to address both of those problems. We have to think a little bit differently about how to close the access gap to naloxone for our patients who have opioid use disorder. A lot of times with this population, co-prescribing is not the problem. Many of these patients aren't even receiving prescription opioids. Perceptions are not a problem. Most of these patients are very aware of the benefits of naloxone, and most of them are, are open to the idea of having it on their person or in their home. However, the problem here with closing the access gap is finding ways to more effectively get access to the physical naloxone itself for those patients. And we can really look at two primary ways of doing that. The first is by better leveraging healthcare resources in order to make sure that the most high-risk patients have the opportunity to get naloxone. And then the second is using community resources to bring the naloxone to where these individuals are in order to make sure that they are able to have access. One way we can do this is by working with patients who we identify as high risk. And so these are individuals who have already experienced the effects of an opioid overdose. The easiest way to get these individuals naloxone using healthcare resources is to provide them naloxone while they're in the emergency department. After a patient has had a non-fatal overdose, they've received treatment in the emergency department, they're stable, this is an opportunity to have a conversation with that patient about what resources are available to them. Ideally, this conversation includes access to evidence-based treatment options like buprenorphine and methadone, but it should also include a conversation about naloxone, explaining to the patient what the benefits of naloxone are, how it works, and why it's important for them to have access to it in the event of an unintentional overdose. And the easiest way for them to have access to it is for them to leave the hospital with naloxone. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. 
but I'm going to talk a bit about our experience with developing a pharmacy-driven naloxone distribution program within our emergency department. While developing our pharmacist-driven naloxone distribution program in our emergency department, we identified five key areas that were crucial to the success of the program. The first is to recognize that implementing the program doesn't actually mean people are using the program. You can put all the infrastructure in place that you want, but if people are not aware of how to get the naloxone to the bedside, how to identify the patients at risk, or who are willing to even use the program in the first place, then it doesn't matter how many tools you make available, it's not a helpful program if people don't want to use it. So you need to take the steps to get institutional support. This means working with administration, working with department chairs, finding people to really take this from the top down and support your efforts uh, to increase access to naloxone in your emergency department. You also need to identify some people who are going to drive this program in the actual department itself. So individuals who are going to talk with their colleagues about it, explain the benefits, really champion the program in order to get buy-in uh, from all the individuals who will have the opportunity to use the program and to provide naloxone to patients. The second is to be familiar with the policies and regulations that are going to govern your program. These would include state laws, hospital regulations, working with your pharmacy, figuring out issues with insurance. Is this going to be billed on the inpatient side, on the outpatient side? Do you have an outpatient pharmacy associated with your hospital that can provide these at discharge? There's a lot of different ways that you can build the program, but you do need to make sure that you're working with uh, your hospital administration, your pharmacy team, your legal team to make sure that your program fits all state policies and regulations. The next hurdle we experienced with, was cost. And is there a way to make this a sustainable program for your hospital? Again, there's a lot of different ways you're going to do this, and it's really going to depend on what the laws and regulations look like in your state. Are there funds or supplies available through your state or county department of health? Is there grant funding available? Can you pay for it out of a normal pharmacy or ED budget? This really requires you to work again with your team in order to figure out what are the best solutions for making the cost of the program sustainable to the hospital or to the health center. The next step is really finding a clear flow for your distribution of naloxone. How are patients identified? How does the naloxone get to the bedside? Who teaches the patient about what the naloxone is and how to use it? And who makes sure that they leave the hospital with the naloxone? These are all important steps in the process, and you need to make sure that each individual responsible for each step understands how to activate that piece of the puzzle and, and is making sure that they are doing their job to ensure that patients identified naloxone gets to the bedside, patient learns about the naloxone, and patient leaves the hospital with the naloxone. And then the last important thing is education. You really need to make sure that everyone involved understands the components understands the importance, understands why you're doing this. Take the time to let people ask questions because they will have questions. And if you take the time to answer them and make them feel more comfortable, you increase the likelihood of the overall success of the program. Even though the emergency department is a really effective way to increase access to naloxone, it shouldn't be the only way. Ideally, we should be providing patients with access to naloxone before they've had an overdose event and ended up in the emergency department. Two ways that we can do this is by leveraging pharmacy resources and State Department of Health resources. I'll speak specifically about New York State Department of Health because that's where I'm located, but you should certainly reach out and contact your local, county, or state health departments to get more information on what resources are available in your region. Pharmacies are a great way to increase access to naloxone within communities. We are the most accessible healthcare professionals in the United States. For many of these patients, we may even be their only point of contact with the healthcare system. So it's really important for pharmacists to understand who can benefit from access to naloxone, how naloxone works, how to teach someone how to use the device, Pharmacists have an opportunity to 
work on the front lines of harm reduction and help to reduce opioid overdose deaths in the United States. Unfortunately, there remain significant access gaps for patients seeking naloxone from community pharmacies. When we look here at data from New Jersey, what you see is that when you look at communities who have opioid-related hospital visits and compare the number of visits to naloxone availability, there is a trend suggesting that in communities hit hardest, so in communities where there are the highest number of opioid-related hospital visits, we see low availability of naloxone in community pharmacies. Over on the far right, the most extreme portion of the, the graph, we see that in communities where there are between 16,000 and 18,000 opioid hospital-related visits, only about 15 to 25% of pharmacies are actually carrying naloxone in those communities. So we need to make sure as a first step that every pharmacy has naloxone available should a patient need to access it. In order to increase access to naloxone through pharmacies, there are two important approaches that we need to look at. The first is standing orders. Now, every state in the United States has some form of standing order that allows a pharmacist to provide naloxone to a patient without a patient-specific prescription. The way these programs work does vary from state to state, so it's important to work with your state board of pharmacy to understand what those regulations look like in your region. But the best way to ensure that people are able to use these standing orders appropriately are, number one, increasing awareness of pharmacy standing orders. So help your colleagues to understand what these standing orders look like, how you use them, particularly working with pharmacy managers who can help train uh, many pharmacists to better understand how to use standing orders to provide patients with naloxone without a patient-specific pers prescription. The other is to make pharmacists more comfortable with using these standing orders. In many states, despite these existing, pharmacists aren't comfortable using them because they don't fully understand the different components of the actual legislation and regulation. So training really needs to focus around what does the law say and how do I use these programs effectively within the regulations themselves. The second key to a successful program is really making sure it has some component of naloxone education. So helping pharmacists to understand what things they should be looking for to help them identify at-risk patients, help them to understand the nuances of how to administer the naloxone, what different devices are available and which device they should be using or recommending, and really help them to understand the data behind this concept of a moral hazard or this idea that providing naloxone is a disservice to my patients because it will encourage my patients to use more drugs. And what the data tells us is for most patients, this is not true. It does not increase use. It only provides a safety net should an unintentional overdose occur. Providing naloxone for blank is the best way to prevent overdose deaths. Police, firefighters, community members, emergency medical services, or EMS. The correct answer is community members. Although providing naloxone for any of these individuals is overall a positive, uh, what we can see is that community members are the best individuals for having access to this antidote because they are the ones who are most likely to encounter someone who has overdosed. If you think about the normal way uh, this process works, uh, someone sees someone who has overdosed, they're not responsive, they call 911, Either police or fire or EMS arrive and then that patient receives naloxone or they get to the hospital and they receive naloxone. Ideally, you would want the person who is involved earliest in that process to have access to the antidote because that would limit the amount of time that goes by before the patient receives the reversal treatment. 
And this holds true when you look at the uh, both healthcare and economic data associated with providing naloxone antidote. So overall, if you look at diff different distribution models, so high distribution to laypersons, police and fire, and EMS, what you see is that if you provide high amounts, high distribution to all three, that is the best way to reduce deaths. And it's actually done at a net benefit cost because of the increase in quality adjusted life years due to the reversal of a number of overdose deaths. So ideally, you're given it to all three groups. You want laypersons to have access, you want police and fire to have access, you want EMS to have access. But when you look at each of the three individual groups, what you see is that the most effective way to reduce deaths overall is to have high distribution among laypersons. In fact, high distribution among laypersons reduces deaths by about 14% compared to high distribution among EMS, which reduces deaths by 5%, and high distribution to police and fire, which reduces deaths by 4%. So again, we, we want all three of these groups to have access to naloxone, but the biggest key stakeholder in this process is increasing access among laypersons, and this is the group that we've been the slowest to target and we've had the least uptake uh, in increasing access to naloxone for. One new program that's trying to tackle the access problem out in the community is Next Naloxone. It's an online harm reduction resource. You can access it at naloxoneforall.org. And when someone goes on the website, they can complete a naloxone training program, complete with information on how to use the device, how to identify an overdose, who to call if there is an overdose, all the really important information you need to know to respond in the event of an opioid overdose. After completing the training, you can get information right online about where to get naloxone in your community. It might be a pharmacy, it might be a local opioid overdose prevention program, but let's say you're not comfortable going there. You don't want to actually go in and get the naloxone, or you don't have health insurance and you're not able to afford the naloxone through one of these programs. Next Naloxone will provide Naloxone to you in the mail. Uh, they do this through a number of different affiliations with states. And ultimately, this program really helps to reduce a lot of the barriers we've already described. It reduces stigma because you don't have to physically go somewhere to get the Naloxone. It reduces other access barriers. Maybe you don't have a car to get to the physical program or you can't afford the cost. Uh, this program has taken huge strides towards increasing access to naloxone at the community level. And their initial data has really shown that they truly are expanding access to naloxone. They're providing naloxone for some of the highest risk individuals. And these are also individuals who have not previously had access to naloxone. So among their first participants who've received naloxone from this program, 70% of them have either experienced or witnessed an overdose. 70% of them have had no previous naloxone training. And almost 90% of them have never had access to naloxone before. And when you look more closely at who's accessing naloxone using this program, the initial data suggests that the rate of individuals requesting access to naloxone correlates with the number of overdose deaths in that state. So it does seem that the people who need naloxone most, when they need it most, are using this resource to increase access to naloxone in their community. In general, we know that the best way to increase access to harm reduction resources, whether that is naloxone or clean needles, is to allow patients to access these in a manner that's most comfortable for them. So even though we prefer these patients get these resources through some form of healthcare, whether it's at a clinic or at their pharmacy, because this gives them the opportunity to learn more about risk factors, to learn how to use the device, to learn about potential treatment resources that are available to them within their communities. At the end of the day, the biggest goal of harm reduction is just to get patients access to these resources in whatever way they're comfortable accessing them. 
And so one other strategy that people have used is increasing access to these through anonymous forms in open areas like vending machines. Programs in Nevada have increased access to uh, clean needles and syringes, to naloxone, through providing uh, vending machine access for individuals who want to use the product. And there's, of course, within that directions on how to use it uh, so that they do have at least some form of training on how to use the naloxone should they ever need to. And this certainly will be an important factor to consider with the potential for access to over-the-counter naloxone. This is not something that we currently have access to in the United States, but it is something that is likely on the horizon. So when that time comes and there is naloxone available over-the-counter in pharmacies, it's really important as pharmacists that we take the opportunity to develop relationships with our patients so that if they are purchasing naloxone from an over-the-counter resource, they're still comfortable asking us questions and learning more about the product. Research has shown that the best way to ensure someone administers naloxone correctly is for that person either to have direct face-to-face -face training with someone who knows how to use the product or at a minimum has a video-based training. Uh, so just getting access to the naloxone is great, but we want our patients to feel comfortable enough with us to have a conversation about what it is, how to use it, how to identify an overdose, so that we increase the likelihood of successful administration if someone were to overdose from naloxone. Now, at the end of the day, the most important thing is we get naloxone into the hands of people who need it. And so these programs can look a little bit different from state to state or county to county, depending on what resources are most readily available. However, what we do know is that ideally within these programs, you're using naloxone nasal spray as your antidote of choice when providing naloxone for these patients. And the reason for this is that my research has shown that nasal spray is the easiest to use and it's administered the most rapidly. We randomized participants to undergo training either with a nasal spray device, an intranasal atomizer device, or an intramuscular device. And after the training, we asked them to administer the device to a simulated overdose victim. And what we found was that every single person who was randomized to the nasal spray was able to successfully administer that antidote, compared to 89.1% of people randomized to the intranasal atomizer and 69.9% of those with the intramuscular kit. And importantly, among those administering the device successfully, those administering the nasal spray device were able to give it the most rapidly. And we know that time is important when providing opioid overdose reversal agents. So when looking at the overall time to administration, it took about 34 seconds to administer the nasal spray versus almost two minutes for the atomizer device and about a minute and a half for the intramuscular device. So a nasal spray device allowed for the highest rate of successful administration and was also the one people were able to administer the most quickly. So I'm a strong proponent of making sure that if possible, the program has access to a nasal spray device in order to ensure participants are most likely to be able to give it successfully and quickly in the event of an opioid overdose. One other issue we encounter is, of course, the issue of cost. And again, this is going to vary state to state, so I would encourage you to reach out to your local county health department or your state health department to see what resources might be available in your region to help patients who want access to naloxone but aren't able to afford it. In New York State, we have the Naloxone Copay Assistance Program, or NCAP. And what NCAP does is it covers some of the difference that's left over after the patient has had their insurance billed. So once we bill in their private insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever is left is a copayment. New York State will cover a portion of that copayment, often leaving no cost or little cost to that individual. Now, certainly uh, there are scenarios where this is not enough or the patient doesn't have access to any form of insurance and they just can't afford the cost. In those scenarios, we have opioid overdose prevention, education, and naloxone distribution programs in New York State that are able to train individuals on how to use naloxone and then provide naloxone to them at no cost. Other states have similar programs in place. 
it's just really important that you are familiar with all the different resources that are available because at the end of the day, you are the point of contact for that patient, for healthcare, for these resources, and you can be the one who helps them to use those resources so that they are able to walk out of your pharmacy with naloxone if they are at risk um, and if they are willing to accept the naloxone. The last point I wanted to bring up today is really some new research that is trying to find creative ways toward expanding access to naloxone at the community level. Ideally, people have already received access at a pharmacy through a local training program, but we know that that is not always the case. There are going to be times where someone has an unintentional overdose and there is someone who identifies or finds that person unresponsive and doesn't have naloxone on their person and they're not able to administer naloxone and have to call 911 and have to wait for emergency medical services to arrive. Now, you know, that's still very quick in some communities, uh, but in, in some scenarios, not quick enough. And so the ideal strategy would be to develop an infrastructure that would allow that individual to get access to naloxone quickly and administer the naloxone even before emergency medical services have arrived. So in this scenario, when you find someone who's overdosed and you don't have access to naloxone and you call 911, a drone delivery service brings that naloxone to you and it gets it to you more rapidly than emergency medical services can arrive on scene. And that gives you the opportunity as the community person to administer the life-saving antidote and speed up that process in order to increase the likelihood that that person has a good outcome. Now, this data is very much in its infancy. This is a, a study that was conducted recently in a dense urban area and really was just to see if this was a feasible intervention. And their data was promising. Uh, it did find that in general, uh, this drone was able to get there uh, and this person was able to administer naloxone in a simulated overdose scenario within about two minutes of calling EMS services. So faster than they're going to arrive on scene. So this is one potential uh, feasible, scalable solution that can increase access for community members who would need to give naloxone in an emergency situation. Now, to be clear, this doesn't take the place of EMS, nor does carrying naloxone on your person. Anytime naloxone is administered in the event of a suspected overdose, 911 should always be called. That patient will need assessment. They may need additional doses of naloxone, or it may not be an overdose at all, and they're going to need additional care. So regardless of if you have naloxone on your person, if they had naloxone on their person, if a drone's bringing naloxone through the skies, doesn't matter. You always want to make sure you've trained that person to call 911 and activate emergency medical services as a part of their overdose response plan. These are my references if you uh, would like to review them.